Good morning and welcome to Corinth Online. We are so glad and grateful that you have decided to tune in and worship with us today. It's going to be a very good Sunday. We're going to spend some time worshiping together. We're going to take communion together. And so if you'd like to gather your supplies, now is a great time to pause and do just that. And then our senior minister, Adam Turner, is going to finish off our current sermon series through the story of Samson. And it's going to be a good day for that. If this is your first time joining us, we want to invite you to connect with us at corinth.cc. And if you haven't already, we want to invite you to head to live.corinth.cc. We think that is the best platform for you to engage and connect with us for worship this morning. I'm ready to go if you are, and so let's get to it. Welcome to Corinth Christian. Let's stand together this morning. Let's give praise to Jesus. to steal what you've saved saying i have no reason to praise i will give thanks oh i will give thanks when the roar that i hear is the voice of my fear trying to silence this hope in my heart i will give thanks oh i will give
Thanks for singing with us. You may be seated. As you're being seated, we're going to continue to celebrate as we watch three baptisms that we've had in the past few weeks. Hi, I'm Madison King. I'm 11 years old, and I'm here to be baptized. I've been going to church my whole entire life, but it wasn't until about three months ago that I really started to think about becoming baptized. Then at Mix, a few weeks ago, there was a subscribe button down by the stage on one of the nights that we went to the auditorium. And you hit the subscribe button to subscribe to God's kingdom if you're ready. And there I knew, okay, God's calling me to be a part of his kingdom. So I went down and pressed it, and now I'm here. What led me to make this decision was, when they announced that there was a subscribe button, I felt a rush of peace over me, like God was calling me to do this. And so that's what I decided to do. I'm excited to become baptized because then I know that I'm a part of God's kingdom and I'm a disciple of him. I'd like to thank my mom, my dad, and my brother, all my family and friends that have helped me through this journey. And finally, I'd like to thank Jesus Christ for dying on the cross for my sins. Addison, we're so proud of you, and uh, it's just been a joy uh, to see you grow in your faith, uh, to see you just understand and learn about Jesus and what he did for you, and also just to watch your acts of service around the church and the way you serve him already. So my prayer for you right now is just that you continue to do that every day. Just commit to him every day and serve him with a loving heart. Will you repeat after me? I believe. I believe Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the Living God. The Son of the Living God. And I accept Him. And I accept Him. As my Savior. As my Lord and Savior. So now we baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of sin and the gift of the Holy Spirit. My name is Jasper and Chris Will, and I'm seven years old. I've been attending for three years at church. I wanted to be baptized, and, and I wanted Jesus to live in my heart. I believe Jesus is my savior. Thank you to my family, and Melissa. I'm super proud of you, buddy. So I need you to repeat after me. I believe. I believe. Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the living God. The Son of the living God. And I accept him. And I accept him. As my Lord and Savior. My Lord and Savior. With that. Oh. <laughs> All right. With that confession there, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Hello, I am Annie Grace Dunbar, and I am here to get baptized. When I was at Mix, I saw a story about a kingdom worker who gave up her birthday to serve for a woman with seven kids. So the kingdom worker raised money to build them a shelter and it really inspired me to get baptized. I think it means that Jesus put us before himself and that he will always love us and no matter what we do wrong he will always forgive us i'd like to thank my cousin sarah my parents um my brother gavin and my grandparents i believe i believe that jesus is the christ that jesus is the christ the son of the living god the son of the living god and i accept him and i accept him as my lord and savior as my lord and savior awesome. <laughs> We're so proud of you. We're so excited for you. Okay, so because of that confession, we're now going to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Ready? Okay. 
Welcome to Corinth. That's a good way to start, right? All right. Uh, my name's Josh. If you don't know me, one of the ministers here on staff, and it's a joy to see you here in the room. And if you're online, man, I hope you're having a great day. We want to invite you to the best place that we think uh, for, for your online experience at Corinth. So follow that website on the screen, live.corinth.cc. We'll see you there uh, real soon. If you're in the room, man, it's so good to see you and glad that you're with us today. We want to connect with you. We're, uh, we're grateful that you came out in, in the busy season of, of life and you prioritized faith. So thanks for being here. The best way I think for us to connect is for you to get out right now the connection card in the inside of your bulletin. It's going to look like this on the screen behind me. So go ahead and get that out, rustle it out, get it out, and uh, fill out as much as you're comfortable with on the front side. And then as you leave today, you can drop it in a bucket, or better yet, you can meet us across the, the hallway uh, in the lobby at our guest services kiosk, and we'll trade you. We'll, we'll take that card from you, but we'll put like a water bottle or a coffee mug or a Scoops gift card, you know, ice cream night. Home Depot, you got a project, we got those too. So probably uh, wondering why I have this green flag, right? Uh, how do you say it? Boogity, 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 let's go racing boys, is that it? Did I get it right? I'm not really a NASCAR guy, but we got lots of things that we are starting this week, this month. Okay, so sorry about my lame attempt at humor. We are starting, we are starting a lot. All right, school is starting. So the back side of that connection card, we want to invite you to pray with us, you'll see it. To, for the students and the teachers. You'll get a prompt tomorrow from an email from us. So just check that box, drop it in the bucket on the way out, you'll get a prompt. We also, next week, have an event called Start Here. And that's where you, if you're newer to faith, newer to Corinth, and you've never kind of attended that before, we want to connect with you and hear from you. We're delighted you're with us here in this auditorium, but we want to get to know you in a smaller space around a table with some good barbecue, all right? It's our pleasure to feed you barbecue, to take care of your kids. Next week, 11 a.m., once again, the back side of that connection card, you can check the box, start here. We'll be in contact tomorrow. School starts this week, so we want to continue blessing our schools with backpacks, with Lysol wipes, and with water bottles. You can bring those in, put them in the bucket, the, the big buckets in the lobby there, okay? Um, Let's see, what else are we starting? The fall starts small groups and uh, middle school programming on Sunday night, August 14th. So if you're not in a small group, we want to get you in one. Check the box, again, on the back of the card. That's, that's kind of the hub for everything you're going to want to do today. Wednesday night, August 10th, some Wednesday evening stuff happens. Elementary programming, high school programming, and some adult elective sort of opportunities. And one that we want to highlight is called Family Life. This is going to take your leadership and your family to the next level, and it's going to be a lot of fun, too. So I think we got a picture for it. Yeah, family life, there we go. Sign up. Once again, back side of the card. Come on out for that. It's going to be a great, great time. Finally, next week, we are starting a brand new sermon series, Lead Like Jesus. And we believe no matter where you are, home, school, work, it's going to take your leadership to the next level as you imitate our Lord and our Savior. So lots of things that we're starting this season. Glad you're here today. And we are concluding today our sermon series, Samson, Muscles, Mayhem, and Mistakes. And we're excited that we're together today because we are expecting that God is going to do something. So once again, I want to reference that connection card again. Anything today. We want you to be expectant that God is going to do something. And so when you hear him speak to you or you're challenged, check a box, drop it in the bucket, and we'll be in contact this week. As we, as we are challenged from the sermon today, Adam's going to give us, our senior minister Adam is going to give us a message of hope from the life of Samson. We're going to take communion together and we're going to sing a few more songs to prepare our hearts even more to worship our great God. The next song we're singing, I love it, it's called The God of Revival. And what a great song to sing as we go back into school, that as our rhythm sort of changes into the school rhythm again, that God would stir up a revival in our lives individually, as a church, as a family, as a nation. So let's pray, and then let's sing out to God that he would do that in and through our church. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you for, for what you do, but also for who you are, that you are a good God. You are our Father that we can always call out to. You know our needs. You know our hurts. You know our desires. And you have all that we need as well. So God, as we sing right now, stir up, our, stir up our hearts to surrender to you in a new way, to 
rest in you, even in the, the mess of life, to, to surrender to you, to your call, like we just saw on, on three videos, three amazing stories. I pray that we would do that today as well. God, we love you, and thank you most of all for Jesus, through whom we pray. Amen. We've seen what you can do, O oh God of wonders. Your power has no end. The things you've done before in greater measure, you will do again. Because there's no prison wall you can break through. possible and there's no broken body you can't raise no soul that you can't save all things are possible the darkest night you can light it up Every day, our, our family uh, gathers around a table. I brought a picture I want to show you of our table we have in our little breakfast nook. 
It's an old-fashioned kind of diner table. Uh, in my wife's words, it was just always in Grandma's house. So we think it's at least four generations old. There are two different layers of yellow, slightly different yellow uh, colors of yellow paint, you know, on the table, and we haven't taken the time to fix it because we got kids and it scratches off all the time anyway, but this is a special table for us. When we eat at home, we're around this table. We have a dining room table as well, but it's usually this one. There, lots of stuff happens around this table. We, uh, we share, we share our, our life as a family, you know, we, we come to the table, we're all sort of hungry and sometimes hangry, but we, we get there and we're together and we're family. In our, in our good days and our bad days, our, our brokenness and, and, and all of it, we're, we're a family around the table. We share stories. And so we'll ask the kids, you know, what happened in the past couple days that made you feel special? Or what did, you, what did you see someone do that made you feel proud? Or what was funny? Or what made you sad? We share stories of life happiness, of sadness, of good times and bad. You know, we come right now sort of to the same sort of thing. It's a table, and this little packet, honestly, it doesn't look like anything special. It's a plastic thing with some juice and a cracker, I guess, whatever it is. It's bread and it's juice. The, the emblems inside here, in and of themselves, aren't anything special, kind of like our scratched-up yellow table. But what does it do? It gathers us as a family. We come here together to pause, to bring our brokenness and accept the gift of Jesus, his body and his blood for us. We share stories, don't we? We share the story of Jesus dying a death in our place, his body broken for us and his blood shed for us. So let's share that story and be a family together around the table. First, let's peel off the top and take the bread, remembering the words of Jesus Christ, our savior himself. When he broke bread, with his disciples at what we call the Last Supper. And he said, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, the, the cup reminds us of Jesus' blood shed for us. And once again, his words said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, thank you for joining us as a family around this table where we can bring our ourselves, our good, our bad, the, the ugly, the shameful, and all of it is 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 healed at the table. It's all forgiven at the table. We are your sons and daughters at the table. Thank you for the story that we get to share that unites us. It's, it's you. It's the sacrifice of Jesus. And so we pause right now, right in the middle of this service today, giving you our attention, and our focus, our worship, and our gratitude. Thank you for this table, for uniting us under the blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord your son. In his name we pray. Amen. Lord, I come and I confess bowing here I find 
Father, that is the uh, reality we have all come into here with today. And uh, we've all brought that in with us right now. We are in desperate need of you. You are our source of strength. You are everything to us. And for those of us who are walking in today with a little bit of extra baggage, a little bit of extra weight, a little bit of extra pain, a little bit of extra discouragement, God, we're asking that in these next few moments that you would continue to speak into our hearts and into our souls, reminding us of your incredible grace, reminding of, uh, us of just how much you love us and how even though we may be done with us, you're not done with us. And even though we may have given up, you haven't given up on us. So would you please speak deeply into our souls today? So we ask that all in the powerful name of Jesus. The church says, amen and amen. Well, it's good to see you all here this morning and uh, glad to have you all here in the room. Um, last Sunday before school starts, and uh, it's kind of weird for, for us. Um, both of our kids are now out of school, um, you know, out of like, you know, K through 12 stuff. And so it's like, I just don't care. You know, it's just kind of kind of weird. This is like, means nothing to me. It's like, see everybody getting backpacks and stuff. It's like, yeah, blessings on you, you know. Um, but um. <laughs> So we're really glad that you're here today. Um, glad to have you watching online as well, wherever you're watching, uh, Facebook, YouTube, Church Online. Hope you're having a great day. If you're in the room, let's do a howdy on the count of three. You guys ready to our online folks? Ready? One, two, three. Howdy. Thanks for tuning in. Hope you're having a fantastic, fantastic Sunday. And hope to see you here in person next week um, as we start our Lead Like Jesus series. It's going to be fantastic. Can't wait for that. Um, so hope you'll come back and join us next Sunday. And whether you're online or in the room, thank you so much for your continued generosity, the way you're continuing to give and support what the Lord is doing here, and, and whether you're doing that online, uh, whether you're doing that through the USPS, whether you're using the envelopes in front of you there and the giving stations throughout, uh, thank you, thank you very, very much. Uh, we're, we're excited to announce today, um, you know, we've been talking about, if you've been around here for a little bit, of like our Four Generations 2.0 campaign and about getting to build our elementary building out over there. And it's just been a long, long process, longer than any of us wanted it to be. Um, we actually tried to start this capital campaign in March of 2020, 
Um, I don't know if you know, something happened then. Um, but um, <clears throat> so we're excited. And now all we're la- lacking is a little piece of paper called a b- building permit. And once we've got that in hand, we're going to start moving dirt and getting that thing uh, built real soon. So we're, we're super excited about that. And uh, your giving to four generations um, is enabling us to pay cash for that building. So thank you very much for that. And any giving from now on will go to help continue to pay for cash for that, pay cash for that, and for the uh, other phases that are coming. Um, if you've got questions about that, you know, please grab one of the FAQs or one of the booklets. It's just, they're spread out all around the building. But good stuff, right? Let's give God thanks for that. It's going to be incredible. <clears throat> You know, we, we are a church that is unashamedly and unabashedly about passing the truth on to the next generation. Psalm 78 verse 4 says, we will not hide these truths from the next generation. And that is our heartbeat right here. And we believe that that building is going to be just another great tool in our arsenal of passing the faith along to the generations as they c- continue to come along through here. So that being said, let's jump into a message, right? You guys ready? Turn to your neighbor and just say, I'm ready. Let's go. Let's go. Come on now. Let's go. Let's go. All right. So we've all had moments in life, you know, um, that we just kind of wish we could have back. Anybody ever had that happen? It's just like, man, I wish I could have that back. You know, I wish I could have a, a do-over. You know, I wish I could just call Mulligan and just like take one more shot at this thing. You know, I, we've all had those moments like that. And in my life, I've had multiple moments, more than I can even begin to count, of just like, oh my goodness, I did not handle that the way that I wanted to handle that. But one of them that just always comes to mind whenever I think about this um, goes all the way back to whenever Jennifer and I were, were, were dating um, 25 years ago. And so um, we started dating whenever she was a junior in high school and I was a freshman in college. So she was the cool kid in high school that had the college boyfriend and I was the, the guy in college with the high school girlfriend, you know. And so it, it was fantastic. But um, so uh, Jennifer was a, a cheerleader at our high school, Carthage High School there. And um, I played basketball over at Ozark Christian College there in, in Joplin, Missouri. And so because of that, um, you know, our schedules never really lined up. You know, like there was never really an opportunity like for me to go to one of her games and cheer her cheering on, you know, kind of thing. And, and so um, it just never really worked out because it's like generally if there was a game there, I had a game, all these other kind of, well, one night, one day. You know, like the moon and the stars and the calendar, it all just aligned. And it was like, I had an opportunity to like go to one of her games where she was cheering. She went to all of my games, you know, but I was able to get over to to one of her games. And so, you know, the calendar aligned and I just decided, you know, I'm going to make her day and bless her with my presence, you know, and just help her just know how fortunate she is, you know, to have me in her life. And so... You know, the game started that evening, and the way it worked in, in my high school is, um, and some of the high schools work like this, but um, like the JV would play first, junior varsity would play first, and then the varsity guys would play after that. And so there's always those two games. Well, I, I couldn't make it to the JV game <clears throat> because I had practice, and so I was just kind of coming in, coming in hot, you know. And um, so, but evidently, something happened in the JV game where she was out there cheering, and she hurt herself and um, hurt her ankle. 25 years later, I'm still not for sure what she did, um, you know, details. Um, but <clears throat> she, she hurt her ankle, um, you know, pretty bad, and so they had, like, taken her up into the bleachers, and they were just kind of watching over her and taking care of her and those kind of things. And so um, now, now something you need to know about me, all right, to take a time out real quick, is whenever it comes to my giftings, um, empathy and compassion are not like at the, the top level there, okay? Now, I'm much better at 43, you know, now. I, like, I've learned and I've grown in empathy and compassion and those kind of things. But I'm just telling you, at 18, whole buddy. You, you know, it's just like my life motto is like whenever I hurt my finger and I showed it to my basketball coach, you know, he, he was like, what? Nobody ever died from a broken finger. Get back out there, you know? And so that's kind of just how I live my life, you know? And so I walk into the gym and there Jennifer is up on the bleachers, and she's in the, in the bleachers, people all around her, you know, like just giving her all kinds of attention. And so let me ask you a question. What should, okay, what should a new boyfriend, we've been dating for like a month or two at this point, what should a new boyfriend do in that moment, Right? Okay, now you guys are smart people, you're watching online, you're already smarter than I am, and so um, you guys know what the correct answer is, right? It's like, you should go over there and go, hey baby, you doing all right, you know, everything okay, you know, do you need me to get you some ice, you know, do you need that? It's like, I see you're crying and you're upset, do you need a Snickers, you, you know, something, something like that, right? That, that's exactly what you, you should do. Everybody say, you should do that? You should do that. Is that what I did? 
no, that is not even remotely close to what I did, you know? And so I walk up to her. There she is. She's crying. Got all these people around her. And I looked at her. And with all the empathy and compassion that I can muster, I just look at her and go, so you hurt your ankle, huh? And then I saw two of my friends across the gym, and I just left and just went and sat with them. And then she was possessed by the spirit or something because she yelled something at me. I'm still not for sure what it was that she, she yelled at me. But here we are, 25 years later, and look at us. We still made it, right? You know, it's just like amazing. And so I look at that time, and I look at that story, and I just like, I, it's like it's so embarrassing to tell you that it's just like, that is just how boneheaded, just egocentric, just lack of empathy, lack of compassion that I actually was. And I look at it, and it's like, man, I could have handled that so much better. I wish I would have handled that better, and not just because 25 years later, I still hear about it. You know, it has nothing to do with that, but it's just like, I know that that's not what you're supposed to do now. Like, if I could go back and do it again, I would do it again, right? And I would completely change the way that I handled, you know, that situation. And I think we all understand that, right? Because we all have those things that we just wish I could give it another shot. You give me one more try at this, and, like, I'm going to do so much better this time, you know? I mean, maybe give me two more shots. But, you know, it's like, you give me just a couple more shots here, and I'll handle this so much better. You know, it's like, it's that text message that you thought you were sending to a person, okay? But it was actually in the group message, you know? And it's just like, oh, man, undo. There is no undo on that. You know, it's the reply all instead of reply to. It's the phone call you made whenever you were angry, you know, somebody once said, you know, um, give a, speak whenever angry, and you'll give the best speech you'll ever regret. And you're like, oh, my goodness, I wish I could just take a moment and just kind of back away from that again and just maybe count to 134,000 and just kind of give me just a second here. It's the, it's the purchase that you wish you wouldn't have made, but it has a no return policy. It's the, you know, it's the choice that you made. It's the way you handled the situation. It's the way you reacted to brand new information. It's the words you spoke in anger. And we all look back at those things and we just kind of go, can I have another shot at that? Can you just give me one more, just one more try, you know? So here's my question for you today. What do you do when you know you've blown it? What do you do whenever you know that you've absolutely failed? What do you do whenever you know you stood up there and you shanked it? What do you do whenever you know you just absolutely just messed it all up? What do you do? You wasted the opportunity. You said what you shouldn't have said. You did what you shouldn't have done. What do you do when you've blown it? See, learning to deal with failure is one of the biggest lessons that we all have to learn at some point in our life. Because we all fail, okay? Let's just get that out of the, let's get that all the way, you know? We all fail, we all have mess ups, we all blow it, we all have those opportunities that we just completely miss. But here's something that I, I just wanna speak to the men for just a second here, because here's what I know about you, all right? It, is that it's this, and this is in your notes. One of a man's greatest fears is failure. And his failure is often the source of his greatest regret. Every single man in this room is just like, yeah, I understand that. I don't want to be seen as a failure. I want to succeed. I want to be good. I want to be the best at what I do. And then whenever that doesn't happen, whenever we're not perfect, whenever we don't make the right choice, we make the wrong business decision, we make the wrong relationship decision, and we fail at it, then it gets to this point to where we just live with that regret the rest of our lives. And so learning how to deal with our failure in a way that is healthy, in a way that is godly, in a way that is biblical is so important for us. And so as we conclude Samson's story today, what we're going to see, and this is the great news about Samson, is this, is that just because you failed at something doesn't mean that you're a failure. Just because you failed at something doesn't make you a failure. And so let's, let's go back to our guy, Samson, here. If you haven't been with us for the past few weeks, we've been looking at maybe one of the most famous judges in the entire Bible, Samson, known for his strength, known for his weakness with women, and um, just a, an incredible, incredible story. And if you haven't been with us, um, or if you've missed you know, the, the past several weeks, um, you can jump on the website and get caught up. But let's just review real quick. What do we know about Samson, okay? First thing we know is that he was a strong man with an incredibly weak will. Okay, physically strong, weak will. We know that Samson 
Samson was a guy who was empowered by the Spirit of God, but yet he was led by his emotions. And then we also saw last week that Samson didn't ruin his life in one big moment, but it was what? It was one small step at a time. And that's just kind of his, his story. And so whenever we last left him, um, he had been seized by the Philistines. Okay, last week we talked about the famous story of Samson and Delilah. And so he ends up, his head is shaved. Um, the Philistines capture him. They gouge out his eyes. And so that's what, this is what that means. They took hot iron you know, uh, rods and like burned his eyes out. And then they scooped out whatever was, was left. Okay, so they did that to him. And then they tied him up to a grindstone and they start treating this guy guy like an ox where they just put him to grinding uh, grain all day long. That's all he does now. And so you can imagine where he is. He's just in this place where he's being mocked. He's being called names. They're throwing stuff at him. They're spitting on him. They're, they're just laughing at him. He is a joke. And so here he is in this moment in his life. He is experiencing physical agony, right? I mean, he's lost his eyesight. I mean, he's, he's just grinding away every single day. But it's not just physical agony. It, there's spiritual agony. I mean, you think about this. Samson has to live with the fact that he wasted years of his life. He wasted the gifts that God gave him. God gave him incredible gifts, and he just wasted it all. He's living not just with physical agony and spiritual agony. He's living with the pain of regret. You know, and I'm just going to throw this out here. I imagine that there's somebody watching online or there's probably some folks here in the room that you know the pain of regret all too well because your wife found your browser history and you had to have that conversation, you know, or you had to explain to your kids why you violated your wedding vows because you were chasing after some Delilah. You know, you sit there and you have regret because of the one who, who got away. I mean, she wanted to get married. She wanted to have a serious relationship and you just wanted to be a boy that can shave. And you just strung her along, strung her along, wouldn't commit. And then finally she says, I ain't putting up with this. And now here you are, you live with regret. You know, you're married and you spent years just investing in your kids and you never invested in your marriage and now your kids are moving away and what you found is like you don't have a marriage, you're roommates. And you live with the pain of regret. Some of y'all, it's not an outward thing, it's an inward thing. And you live with the pain of regret of every single promise that you made to the Lord. You come in here, it's like, I promise you, God, I'll do this, I'll do this, I'll do this. And then you walk out and you don't do anything about it. And so now you just live with the regret of broken promises broken promises to God. And if that's you today, I just want you to perk up your ears for just a second. And, you know, as my, my dad always told me growing up, I want you to pick your chin up for just a second. I want you to pick your chin up and I want you to hear this, okay? Listen to me. Failure is an event, never a person. It's something that happened. It does not define who you are. It is an event. It's real. It took place. Nobody's denying that. But that is not the label that you carry around with yourself. It's an event. It's never a person. And here's my good news to you, okay? I'm going to perk you up for just a second. You guys ready for this? I don't care how bad you failed. You have not failed as bad as Samson did. Okay, so at least you can compare yourself to him and go, well, I didn't do that, you know, because it's like, you look at him, nobody failed more than Samson did. Because, I mean, think about this, he did not just bring shame to himself. He brought shame to an entire nation of people. He completely messed it up, but yet God wasn't done with him. And in fact, the last verse we read last week was Judges 16, 22, whenever it just says, but the hair on his head began to grow again. In other words, God's not done with him. God's got something left for him to do. And if you think this morning that God only uses perfect people to accomplish his will, the only reason you think that is because you've never read your Bible. Because if you read the story of the Bible, it's just like imperfect person after imperfect person. In fact, there's only been ever one perfect person that God used. His name was Jesus. And last I checked, he's not you, okay? And so he is the only perfect person that has ever existed. Imperfect people are used by the perfect God to accomplish his perfect will. And that's what we're going to see here in Samson's life. Look there at verse uh, 23, Judges chapter 16. It says, now the rulers of the Philistines... 
They assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to celebrate, saying, Our God has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hands. And when the people saw him, they saw Samson, they praised their God, saying, Our God has delivered our enemy into our hands, the one who laid waste our land and multiplied our slain. So what are the, the Philistines doing? Well, they're basically, they're having a worship service, okay? They're having a night of worship, and they're celebrating because their enemy, Samson, has been conquered. He's been vanquished. You know, he's right there. He's blind, eyes gouged out, no strength, all these things. And so they're worshiping their god, a Dagon. And um, now Dagon, we'll throw a picture up uh, of Dagon right up here. And so this is what uh, he looked like. So it's a, it's a guy, this is their, their deity, a guy with a, the, the body of a man, or you see, the head of a man and the body of a fish, okay? It looks like a mermaid, right? And so it's a, it's a Philistine god of fertility or grain, a little, little unclear what it is. But so this is who they're worshiping. And so they're going, it's like, Dagon gave us Samson. He brought us Samson. He, he brought a, him into our hands. He's conquered him. And it's like, we got to get together. We're going to throw a night of worship. We're going to celebrate. And so they get together in their temple, which is more like, think like a coliseum, okay, which has got like these huge pillars around it. It's got like some like upper deck seating. You know, it could hold about 5,000 people is what archaeologists kind of kind of think. And they start singing to, to Dagon, their God. They're like, oh, my goodness, you've defeated our enemy. you defeated our enemy. And we look at that, and it's just like, you know, why are they so, why are they so like jazzed up about this? And well, don't forget, okay, if you remember Samson's story, he destroyed their economy, right? I mean, a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about how he got mad, and so he captured 300 foxes, tied them tail to tail, put torches in between their tails, and sent them out into the grain fields and in the vineyards, okay, which destroyed their economy for a year and plus 10. Okay, and then if you think about it, he also, he killed a bunch of their people. Like the one day, whenever he needed to, to, to pay off the gambling debt, he just walks into town, finds 30 guys wearing clothes, and he's like, I need those, and kills them. You know, at the end of the chapter, you know, of 15, he kills 1,000 people with the jawbone of a donkey. Now, here's the thing. This is where reading the Bible, we got we to gotta, we gotta be smart, okay? For us, that was one chapter ago. Okay, we're like, well, that just happened. Okay, but there are 20 years in between those chapters that are going on. And so for them, it's, it's two decades worth of vengeance, you know, hatred and anger and humiliation. And so now after two decades of this long-haired, muscled-up freak, you know, just giving them all kinds of trouble, they're like, look at him now. We got him. Look what Dagon did for us. How could we not give thanks to him? And says, so, so while they were in high spirits, that means exactly what you think, okay? Drunk as skunks, okay? That, that's what I mean. They shouted, probably slurred, you know, uh, bring out Samson to entertain us, you know? <laughs> and so they called Samson out of the prison, and he performed for them. And you got to think at this life, at this point in Samson's life, I don't know that you could think of any point lower for him. This is the deepest failure that he's ever experienced. And they parade him out like he's some circus freak. Do some tricks for us. But his story is not over. Now, I, I want to hit the pause button on Samson real quick because I, I, I want to talk about this because Samson's in this place of just like deep failure. And whenever it comes to failure, there are generally two responses to failure that, that we can have, okay? Basically, two responses. Just, let's just get it super simple here. The, the first response is regret. This is how we, this is the natural response to failure, right? We just begin to regret. It's like, oh my goodness, I wish I wouldn't have done this, you know? Or I wish, oh my goodness, I can't believe I did that. And, and regret, don't miss this, it focuses on shame and blame, you know, the shame part of it is, is like, oh, I feel bad. I feel terrible. I'm no good. People will be better without me. And it's just, you know, you start to wallow in self-misery and self-pain. Um, you know, you kind of, you know, just like you're always beating yourself up. And, you know, you're thinking about your problem. You're just focused on it and on it and on it. And that's shame. But it can also lead to blame, okay? Re regret, it just gets us to his place. I mean, you think about Samson's. I mean, it, can you almost hear Samson going, it's like, well, if Delilah wouldn't have ratted me out, then I'd be fine. You know? Or could you hear Samson maybe saying something like this? I never asked to be called by God. 
I didn't, get call, I didn't ask if I wanted to be a Nazarite from, from birth. I mean, this isn't on me. This is on God. I mean, if he wouldn't have put that on me, then I, then I wouldn't have had, I mean, I didn't ask for this strength. And that's, that's what regret does. But here's the thing. Here's, here's the thing about regret, okay? It gets you nowhere. It'll get you nowhere in life. But yet so many of us, we just stay in that natural response of just, I regret what I did. I regret what I did. I feel ashamed. I feel ashamed. Or I'm going to blame others for, for what's going on. But the, the, the best response is, is repentance. That's the second response. Is repentance. And that's the best response. Because what repentance does is it ends up leading us to change and transformation. Because instead of like turning inward towards self-hatred and self-flagellation and just like you know beating ourselves up or blaming other people, we instead of turning inward or deflecting outward, we turn upward. And, and we lift our eyes up, and instead of just wallowing in guilt, we say, God, move me through this. I need you to do something through me. And so what we do is we repent, and repentance is just this. We own up to what we did. We take responsibility for what we did. We own up to our mistakes, and we say, this was my fault. This is on me. This is my fault. I had this coming, and, but we don't just stop at owning the problem. We then take action. Because what repentance is, is saying, I didn't do what God wanted me to do. But now I'm going to turn away from what is wrong and move towards what is right. That's repentance. Because here, here's the truth. Here's the truth. Okay, ready? You can't undo your sin. Much as I wish that I could tell you there was an undo button for that, there's no undo button for that. You can't undo your sin. The only thing you can do is repent. You can't unsleep with them, okay? You can't undo the bad deal you made. You can't undo what you look at. You can't undo what you said. You can't undo what you did. But you can repent. Here's how I've got it in your notes. Regret focuses on your past. Repentance moves you toward your future. That's what we're talking about. I've got it written down a few ways in my notes. I like all of these, so I'll just share them with you. So we learn from our past. We don't live in our past. Our past is for our reference, not our residence. It's to be addressed, but not our address. Do not let your past failures, listen to me, listen. Do not let your past failures limit your future opportunities. And it's only repentance that's going to get you where you want to be. Because what's easier? Regret. Shame and blame. That's easier. And you want to know why it's easier? Listen to me. It's because sin is always downhill. It's always downhill. I mean, think about it. You know, it's easy to look at porn. It's easy to get like so into debt you don't even know what to do. It's easy to get addicted. Why? It's all downhill, right? It's just all downhill. And whenever you get all the way down the hill and you turn around and you look up, what are you looking? You're looking uphill, right? And uphill is, don't miss this, it, it's, it's, it's uphill, okay? You know, it, it's not downhill, you know? And so, um, but here's the thing. Everything good in your life is where? It's uphill. It's not downhill. There's only one thing in your life. I, I got to make sure we make this clear for you, okay? There's only one thing in your life that's downhill that's good. And that's God's grace. Okay, that, that's the only thing. It's God's grace. Whenever you declare your faith, you confess your sins, you're baptized into him, that's downhill stuff. You didn't work for that. You didn't earn that. It's nothing. That is just an all a free gift. That is the only thing in life that is downhill that's actually good for you. Everything else that's downhill, it's like it's probably not too good for you. Everything good in your life is uphill. And we know this, guys, don't we? I mean, you think about this. I mean, whenever it comes time and you're like, I want to get a promotion at work. I want to succeed at work. I want to move up the ladder. Where is a promotion? It's not downhill. 
okay? It shouldn't just be you lay around, do nothing, show up late, call out four days a week, you know, and they go, hey, we want to give you a raise and a promotion. It's like, awesome, that's what I was hoping for. It's like, no, what is it? You work your tail off, don't you? You put in the extra hours. You become, you become the employee that you need to be, and that's uphill. I mean, you think about whenever it comes to physical fitness, you know? You don't just get to lay around and have 10% body fat. It, like, takes work, you know? And you've got to go to the gym. You've got to watch your diet. You've got to put in the work. And I know a lot of guys, that's what they do. They put in the fitness work, and they do that stuff. You know, whenever it comes to things like sports, whether it's pickleball or golf or even fantasy football, right? What is that? You want to be good at it? It's, it's what? It's uphill. And so why is it? That when it comes to things that don't really matter at all, so many men will work their tails off to get uphill. But whenever it comes to things that matter, things like their marriage, things like their, their family, like their faith, and they look at that sitting uphill, they go, man, I don't know. Seems like it could be some work to get up there. I mean, you ever thought about, I mean, why would you think? Listen to me. Why would you think? that after you lost their trust, it would be easy to regain it? Why would you think that after you've been absent in your kids' lives for all these years, that now it's going to be easy to just jump into it? I mean, why would you think, you know, you've racked up tons and tons of debt, that now you're just going to be able to call up Capital One and go, hey, uh, can we talk? Um, so sorry, but I spent too much, and I was just kind of hoping we could just, you know, like agree to disagree and just kind of walk away from this. It's uphill. It's all uphill. But man, listen to me. Anything worth it is going to be uphill. I love this quote from John Maxwell. I came across this this week. It says, "This people have uphill hopes and downhill habits." We want all these things, but the way that we live our life just keeps us rolling down the hill. And after everything he's been through in his life, it seems like Samson finally grasps, it's time to go uphill. I've been rolling down the hill for way too long. And he could have given up. <clears throat> But I want you to see what happens there. Verse 25, it says, when they stood him among the pillars, Samson said to the servant who held his hand. I mean, that's where we are. We've got a servant boy that's got to walk the guy that ripped apart a line with his bare hands. He's like, hey, I need you to walk me out to where I need to be. Says to the servant boy, hey, put, put me where I can feel the pillars that support the temple so I can lean against them. And now the temple was crowded with men and women, and all the rulers of the Philistines were there. And on the roof, there were about 3,000 men and women watching Samson perform. Then Samson prayed to the Lord. Sovereign Lord. For the very first time in his life, this is the word that, that, that Samson uses. It's the, the Hebrew word for Yahweh. The, the, the very name that, that God used to reveal himself to Moses in the burning bush in Exodus the holy name of God, sovereign Lord. For the very first time, Samson is orienting himself to the God of heaven. He says, sovereign Lord, remember me. R remember me. That is a request, but it's also Samson remembering his call. God, would you remember me as I remember my call? And then he says, strengthen me. Say it with me. Strengthen me just once more. Just once more, God. That's all I need. I don't need a thousand shots at this one. I just need it one more time. You just give me this one more shot right now. I know how many times I've messed up, and I'm not asking for a thousand, a million second chances. I just need just one more chance. Just one more shot, God. That's all I need. Now, if you remember, his hair has started to regrow, but his strength was never in his hair. His strength was always in the Lord. The hair is just a symbol of the strength. It's not the source of the strength. And so Samson, through all of this tragedy, he's lost his hair. But the biggest tragedy is not that he lost his hair. It's he lost his identity. 
He forgot who he was. And so now he's remembering, he's returning, he's, he's, he's making the pivot of repentance, and he's turning towards God, and he says, just strengthen me one more time. That's it, just one last time, that's all I need. And he grabs the pillars. He reached towards the two central pillars on which the temple stands, and bracing himself against them, right hand on one, left hand on the other, Samson says, God, let me die with the Philistines. And then he pushed with all his might, and down came the temple on the rulers and all the people in it. And thus he killed many more when he died than when he lived. My friend, Samson had a choice. Nobody would have blamed him if he just would have wallowed in regret the rest of his life, grinding out grain, laughing stock, being mocked. But instead, he chose to repent. He decided it was time to go uphill. Let the Lord use him for the very purpose that he was created for. And my friends, hear me. Your failures don't disqualify you from being used by God. They may actually put you in just the right position to be used by him in a powerful way. Because here's your bottom line. Your failures, they won't define you. But how you respond to them will define you. You're not what you did. You are who God says you are. And so here's my challenge to you, okay? The question is this. What is uphill that you need to start fighting for? What is it that's uphill that you need to start fighting for? Where are you needing to invest your time, your attention, your money into now that you've let it slip? I mean, maybe let's just start throwing some names around here, right? Maybe it's, it's like it's time to finally start conquering your anger, your lust, your pride, your addiction. Maybe it's time to say, you know, it's time for me to start getting serious about my spiritual rhythms, deepening my faith. Maybe it's time to say, you know what, I need to fight for a better marriage, a better relationship with my kids. I need to get serious about living within my means, being generous and giving. What is uphill that you need to fight for? And then listen to me. I want you to identify it, and I want you to write it down, okay? Like with paper, okay, and a pencil, Write it down. And like, why do I need to do that? That seems like an extra step. No, I know you. Okay? If your wife asks you to go to the store and get up, get milk, get milk and eggs, okay? That's all you need to get. And you're like, okay, I can do that. She says, all right, are you going to write it down? No, I've got it. Mind like a steel trap. <laughs> and so you go to the store. You spend $537. <laughs> and did you get milk and eggs? No, you didn't get milk and eggs. And she's like, where are the milk and eggs? It's like, I'll be right back, okay? <laughs> Why? Why? Because you didn't write it down, right? You know, it's like, just write it down. I want you to write it down. You got space in your bulletin, space in your notes right there. What is the challenge that God is saying, you need to fight uphill for this? And you write it down. And then we're going to write it down. We're going to make a plan. And we're going to do something about it, Right? We're actually going to do something about it. And so if it's like, hey, maybe you need to call and you need to start counseling. And you need to do that. It's like, it's like, it's time for me to quit playing around. I need to deal with this issue. Maybe it's time to check into rehab because you're like, I've tried all the other things. This isn't working. Maybe it's, there's a confession that needs to be made to your small group. Maybe it's you just need to get into a small group with one of our leaders, you know, and just say, hey, I, I, I'm going to be a part of a group. Find community. Maybe you need to find a spiritual mentor. Maybe it's like, I need to find somebody who's going to help me manage my money, okay? It's we're going to make a plan and we're going to do something about it. If it's spiritually, how about this? Listen this. Maybe you stop skipping church because you just don't feel like getting up. Because you stayed up too late on Saturday night, or there's a game on Saturday or Sunday, or because the weather's nice or it's not nice, or you just want to go to the lake, or whatever reason you make up. Maybe it's time to stop doing that. And time to say, you know what, I'm going to wholeheartedly commit. I'm not going to be a consumer any longer. I'm going to be a contributor. And I'm going to invest my time, my money, my, I'm going to pray, I'm going to engage, I'm going to invite folks. Maybe make a plan and just say, I'm not going to spend a day without spending time with my kids. Because here's the deal, okay? A lot of gray hair in here. All of us know. 
At some point, they end up walking out the door. And you blink, and it's gone. And you're going to go, man, I wish we had sippy cups again. Just for an hour. But, you know, but, but I wish. <laughs> I wish we had sippy cups again. How about don't gripe about your marriage, but love your spouse into an amazing marriage. And you pursue them like you did whenever you first met. If you're not married and you want to be, then you work on becoming the kind of person that a godly guy or a godly gal would want to uh, marry. So start studying your Bible. Start praying. Get in a spiritual shape. Find some accountability. Guys, whenever you meet that girl, you start praying with her, open doors for her, write her notes, and then you keep your dirty hands off of her until you've walked her down the aisle. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's time for you to quit kicking the spiritual tires when it comes to God. And lie to yourself that someday I'll really seek him. Today's the day. Call out to Jesus. Ask him to save you. Get baptized. He's here. He's waiting. Give your life to him. What are you waiting on? What's uphill? What's uphill? You identify that. And you chase after it. So God, today, we're asking for you to reaffirm us today in this one thing, that we are not our failures and that our failures do not disqualify us from serving you. And that our failures may be just the exact thing that you're going to use to do immeasurably more than we could ever hope, dream, or imagine. But it's going to begin whenever we quit wallowing around in our shame and our blame and regret. And whenever we truly repent and leave the wrong, leave downhill to pursue you uphill. And so, God, for whoever's in the room today, whoever's watching online, that's been kicking spiritual tires for way too long, lying to themselves, well, someday I'm going to do that, you know. I just want to, I want to do these things first. Would you convict them and convince them to quit lying to themselves? And to begin their pursuit of you. So thank you, thank you for the promise that you don't only use perfect people, but thank you for the perfect one who died to save us from ourselves. And we pray this all in his powerful name, amen. So much for tuning in to online worship today. We hope that you were blessed by our time together. It was a really good time. Uh, now, school is back this week. Are you ready for that? Uh, some of you are, some of you aren't, and some of you are somewhere in the middle. But I just want to offer a couple of reminders as we head back into the start of a school year. First is this we start a brand new series about how to lead like Jesus next week. And so we hope that you'll tune in or join us in person for that. But then we also, on Wednesday, August 10th, are going to start a Wednesday night class all about family life. And so if that would benefit you, we want to make sure that you know you are invited to join us for that. Well, until then, we'll see you next week. Peace and grace.